Hi guys. Everybody doing well? Hi Brooke. Man, the worship team, you guys. You did so good. Did so good. I just love that you didn't um, fall into the trap of feeling like you needed to uh, just stay in the box. But right off the top, y'all were like, mm, we're going to dig into this prophetic little vein here. And you just went off and we were like, go for it. It was so good. I just, I felt a lot of uh, um, pleasure and joy and uh, proud of you guys as you led because I just know that you were reaching for something that was in another realm, in another dimension. The third heaven. Everybody say the third heaven. The third heaven. You don't, might not know what that is, but I'm going to tell you in a minute. All right, that was just a sneak preview. Um, tonight, I'm going to share something I feel like the Lord has put uh, on my heart, and I've been chewing on this for a few weeks now. And uh, so uh, I want you, to, uh, I want you to, to, to listen, and I want you to receive, but you have to, uh, you have to do something for me. When you go to, the, when you go to your, your table, you know, like you're at a restaurant, and you're sitting down to eat, there's action required on your part. You don't just sit there and it's not like an IV. They don't just like give it and you're just like, you actually have to take the fork and pick it up and you got to get a bite on the fork and then you have to move it to your mouth and open your mouth. You got to chew it up and then you have to swallow it, right? So tonight, as we're opening the word, what I'm going to ask for you, your part, is that I need you to actually participate by receiving the word. You need to pick up your fork, and you need to put the word in your mouth, and you need to chew it up and digest it. Or as sometimes in, in scripture, it says, eat the scroll. Everybody say, eat the scroll. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. So it's going to be a little bit weird for you, and you're not going to know what I'm telling you to chant until you're chanting it, but it's going to be good. I promise you're going to be okay. <laughs> if, it, if at any moment when I'm doing this that you're like, no, I can't do that, then just don't do it. It's okay. There's, it's, there's grace. Put your hand on your belly. <laughs> Somebody said, oh, no. <laughs> I want you to repeat out loud this. God, create a holy hunger, create a holy hunger. In, my in my belly for the word of God. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I will take and eat, take and eat. What, you are what you are serving tonight, even if, even if I'm, not hungry, I'm not feeling hungry or I don't like what you're serving. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amen. All right. You said it. I saw it. All of y'all said it. All right. So we're going to dig into the word. We've been in, since the beginning of the year, we've been in this series called Lord Teach Us to Pray. And the heart here uh, is we want to cultivate a praying people. We want a church that's a praying church. And I know you've heard us say this so many times, and we're just going to keep repeating it. But we've been up to this point, we've kind of been in this, like, how do you create a personal prayer life? And we've really been challenging ourselves to go deeper in just a personal prayer life. And then we've made this shift to how do we create a culture of prayer where we're doing corporate prayer together? And tonight, I'm going to attempt to kind of talk about that a little, just a little bit. And hopefully, by the end of the night, I, here's my hope. There's three different people in the room. I'm hoping that you will say, I actually already have this burden on me, and I love corporate prayer, and I'm all in, so I'm here to get more grace and more fuel. Secondly, you might be like, man, I've really never stepped into this, and actually, I want this, and I hope that you get a hunger in, in your heart for this. And thirdly, you might be like, this is offensive, and I don't want, want anything to do with this. And there's grace for that as well, okay? All right. So I just want to, on the front end, just say that. Uh, we're going to look at Luke 11, in, starting at verse 1. You know, I'm thinking about, do I need to? <laughs> that was high tech. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And then Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, 
okay? And he's going to go into what we call the Lord's Prayer. And last week, Barry touched on this because he was, he was talking about what? What did he say that this was, a form of? Crafted prayer, yeah. Barry was really walking us through how to create a crafted prayer. And he pointed to this very, very well-known passage where Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray. And he's like, hey, this is a crafted prayer. And this is a great model that Jesus is going to, he's like, hey, you want to learn to pray? Let me give you a model to get you started. And so he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then he goes on. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and you say, hey, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey and has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside says, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, the audacity, (laughs) if you know, you know, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Then he goes on, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus says, hey, when you pray, what's the first thing he says? When you pray, say what? Our Father. He starts right off the bat. He says, look, When you come to pray, it starts with looking at someone. Right off the bat, it starts with looking at someone. Our Father, you're addressing him. You're fixing your eyes. You're fixing your gaze. You're lifting your gaze. Everybody say lifting your gaze. I'm going to say that phrase a thousand and fourteen times tonight. You're going to get so sick of it. I hope that tonight when you go home, you wake up in the middle of the night dreaming, lift your gaze. It's very common, however, for us to come into corporate prayer. I'm talking about corporate prayer. We, Valerie mentioned it on Tuesdays in here at noon to two and on Wednesdays from seven to six, we pray. Really, really important <laughs> from six to seven. We travel back in time. It's powerful. You should come. I'm telling you, you're missing out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very common for us to come into corporate prayer and we, we come in and we sit down in a big pile of our emotion and feelings. Very common. We're kind of like, here I am. How am I feeling today? Uh, yeah. I, and Valerie, you even were talking about this. Like sometimes you come in and you're like, oh man, I'm not feeling very well today. I, yeah, I'm kind of angry or I'm sad or I'm distracted. I've got all kinds of stuff going through my brain. And the, the reality is that's just kind of how we've been programmed. And I want us as a, as a people, as a body to shift because I want some, something bigger is going on. And I want us to shift from kind of sitting down and being like, how am I feeling? So I'm approaching corporate prayer from my feelings I want us to shift from sitting down and saying, our Father, lifting our gaze and saying, yeah, our Father, hallowed be your name. Give me a glimpse of the glory realm. Give me a glimpse of the throne right now. Set my gaze to the throne. When we come to corporate prayer, we've got to learn to take our souls out of the driver's seat, put it in the back seat, and put who in the front seat? Holy Spirit in the front seat. And our souls are your mind, will, and emotions. So it's this like combination. You, maybe you come in, your soul's in charge, and you're super distracted because it's like, I got a thousand things going on that I've got to be doing. I don't know why I'm here. I need to be getting after the stuff that I need to be doing. Or again, you might come in and be like, ugh. But we've got to get familiar with that shift. There's a powerful gift for us if we make the shift 
from praying with our soul or praying with in the first and second heavens. I think Valerie has mentioned this before, the first and second heavens mentality and shifting from that to a third heaven. See, there's the third heavens. I told you I was going to get to that. All right, I'm gonna, just really briefly, I'm going to give you context for what that is. And you could take a deeper dive in this, but this idea of first heavens, second heavens, and third heavens. Simply put, you sometimes are reading in scripture and you see it's talking about the heavens and it's like, you know, the skies and the da 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 da. Well, that's probably referring to not to the throne room, but it's probably referring to the natural realm or sky, birds, clouds this realm that we live in. We can touch and feel. It's the heavens. It's like this is the realm that we live in, okay? Second is, the second heavens is principalities governing authorities over a region, or some would say spirit realm, or it's even referred to in Revelation as mid-heavens, okay? Tracking with me? And then the third heavens is throne room paradise where God dwells. Okay, simply put, that's just how it's broken out, okay? And I'm just going to give you a little bit of context here. So in the second heavens, for instance, in Daniel 10, Daniel, uh, he's he's on this fast, which we now call the Daniel fast. It's this 21-day fast. But he set his heart towards humbling himself before the Lord because he wants to know more of the Lord, right? And so he goes into prayer and fasting for 21 days. And then we're going to jump in in verse 12 of Daniel 10, where an angel has come and and we're kind of jumping into the middle of this conversation. But the angel says, then he, the angel continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And let's ask the question, where was his words heard? He, he prayed from the first heavens. He prayed from the natural, from here on earth. And it says, hey, the angel says, from the first day that you started praying on earth, your words were heard. His words were heard in heaven, the third heavens, in the throne room. And then he says, and I have come in response. So that means he was in heaven, angels in heaven with God. And then they hear his words on earth in the throne room. And then he's deployed. They say, hey, Go, go send this message to this guy, right? So he leaves the third heavens, he leaves the throne room, and he's headed to earth, okay? And then verse 13, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. So as he's journeying from the third heavens to the natural realm to communicate this to Daniel, he gets caught up in the second heavens, in this principalities governing authorities over a region. He gets caught up by the prince of the Persian kingdom. And now this is not a real dude that's the prince of the Persian kingdom. This is a principality. It's a demon that has some authority for some reason over this area, and he's pretty strong. And so as this angel's trying to come to, to send this message, he gets caught up. Okay, and then he goes on, another angel, Michael, uh, one of the chief princes from heaven, came to help me because I was detained. And he later goes on and says that I actually got to go back and do some more battle. But that's just a little glimpse into the second heavens, this demonic spiritual realm where demons, angels are battling. Okay, let's look at the third heavens real quick. Uh, This is all important. I'm building a foundation because I'm going to say... What am I going to say? I'm going to say, lift your gaze. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So the third heavens, Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 2. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heavens. Okay. It's right there in scripture. He says third heaven. And if there's a third heaven that Paul's speaking of, then there's got to be a second and a first, right? So then he goes on verse four. He, this guy was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. So Paul kind of just barely gives us this glimpse like, man, hey, I know this guy, which some people, some scholars say this was actually Paul talking about himself in the third person. He's like, I know a guy that was caught up in the third heavens. All right. Revelation four. Let's go there real quick. After this, this is John speaking he says, after this, whatever happened in one, two, three, he says, after this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard first speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the spirit. So he's, he's 
on earth, and then the, the angel says, hey, see this open door? Come up here. And it, once he stepped through the door, and he said he was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne were seven lamps blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. What an image. Woo! So here's the thing. Hey, Amen. Mm, I need that. I need some of that. Mm. Y'all unlo- unlock a whole, a whole other dimension to my, uh, yeah, can you, Barry, could you do that for me? Get some organ stuff. <laughs> we have to learn, we have to learn to come into corporate prayer and lift our gaze to the throne room and rise above the first and second heavens, Okay. I'm using that term, I could say, rise above the flesh and the second heavens. But I'm just going to say the first heavens, and I just mean your soul, the flesh, whatever's going on on earth. We've got to learn to rise above that. And the, their distractions, their distractions that are keeping us disconnected from the throne. And real quick, before I move on, I just want to say, if you're like, man, how do I learn to like, set my gaze? How do I lift my gaze? A little pro tip is go to Revelation 4 and 5 and just read through that over and over and close your eyes and say, Holy Spirit, what did John see? I want to see and I want to come up. I want to lift my gaze. Revelation 4 and 5, super, I mean, powerful stuff. Okay, Ephesians 2, verse 6. And God raised us, us is me, say, that's me. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in what? What does it say? In the heavenly realms with Christ or in Christ Jesus. So he raised you up. You've been seated in heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. The prayer room, when we come in here into this room and we engage, we lift our our gaze, we're walking into a regional governmental center. A who, what, what? a regional governmental center. This room that just feels like, no, this is a worship center. I've been in a worship church, worship room. This actually is not. This is a regional governmental center. And here's how I'll explain. Now, all analogies break down. So don't try to like, you know, flesh this all the way out. But imagine that in Washington, D.C., we have Capitol Hill, right? That is the seat of our national government, right? Okay, so it's in Washington, D.C. Here in Little Rock, we have the capital, the state capital of Arkansas. It is the local, the seat of our local regional government, right? Imagine if you were a lawmaker here in Arkansas and you went into the state capital. And when you went in, you went and found the special door and you knocked on the door. You knocked on the door. And then when you stepped in, you immediately were in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill. What? That is what it's like in this room. Believe it or not, it actually is reality. It does, we don't think that it is because we're programmed to just kind of come in and be like, oh, how am I feeling? But actually, there is a door here, an access straight to the throne. And when we come in, we have authority We have authority. We can step in. We can step beyond the natural and we can go beyond the second heavens and we can go straight into the throne room. But we have to lift our gaze. Say, lift our gaze. gaze. All right. So, yep. Say what? Okay, thank you. I heard you the first time. I just want to make sure you said it nice and loud. We have to put our flesh or our soul in the back seat, okay? But we also have to rise above the second heavens. I said that a minute ago. We've got to rise above the second heavens. And why is that important? Well, Satan will first, in the first heavens in the natural, Satan will let you be busy 
doing life or ministry. He's all about that. He's like, hey, you want to get busy, man, I'm cool with that. You go do your deal. And you're like, oh, I'm doing lots of stuff. I'm super busy. I'm so crazy busy. Uh, and he's like, hey, have fun. You're in the first heavens. You're in your whole life. You got it all spun up. You're doing great. Okay, the moment that you turn yourself towards prayer, all hell breaks loose. Nothing puts hell on notice like a man or a woman who has a prayer life. And both of them are distractions. See, both of them are, are meant to distract you. The first heavens and the second heavens. And I don't say that to strike fear in your heart. I just say that so that you understand the enemy's schemes, that, that you, you aren't unaware. Sometimes we're unaware. We're, we come in and we're like, okay, I'm, gonna over, I'm not going to do this flesh thing. I'm going to put the soul in the... And all of a sudden you're like, but I'm feeling so dark. There's like so much. I don't really know. And the enemy, he knows that. And he's like, man, come on, guys. Like, let's lay... She's in, she or he's in the second heavens. Let's go. And so here, here's the thing. Our warfare, though... We want our warfare to be God-centered warfare. High worship, high intercession, exaltation of Jesus. We are aware of his schemes, but we don't give him airtime. We focus on the supremacy of Christ. We come into this room knowing that there's an all-out war to keep us distracted in, in the first and second heavens. And then what do we do? We lift our gaze and we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I see the door and I'm going to walk through and I want to walk into the throne room. And I want to gaze on the one, the lamb that was slain. I want eyes to connect to those blazing eyes. I want to rise above the first and the second heavens. I want to go up with you. We have to have eyes that go beyond the natural. And if you come in to a prayer room on a consistent basis and you're in one of those places, the first or the second heavens, you're kind of stuck all the time in that. Well, no wonder we don't want to come to corporate prayer. Makes sense. It's like, I'm bored. I'm so tired. This worship leader won't stop singing holy, 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 holy. It's like, geez, we get it already. Meanwhile, the Spirit of God is hovering, and he's waiting, he's long, he's at the door, and he's like, look up, come up here, look up, there's a door here, if you would just like get out of that and come up here, there's something really great for you in here. He's inviting you in. Woo. All right, so G Jesus, we started with Luke 11, his disciples, they ask him to teach them to pray, and it's after three years of following him. It's really interesting. After three years of following him, they, they've been watching him heal the sick. They've watched him raise the dead, preach powerful sermons, turn water into wine, cast out demons, and they ask him, teach us to pray. They don't say to him, hey, would you teach us to preach, or will you teach us to heal the sick? They figured out by watching his ministry that the secret sauce to his ministry was prayer. And no doubt they were like, hmm, you know, I've been watching Jesus and I noticed something really interesting. And another guy's like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Is this the prayer thing? Yeah, if you notice that, he like goes into the prayer, his place of prayer, and then he comes out full of the Holy Spirit. What is up with that? Somebody needs to go ask him to teach us to pray. That's, they figured out that was the secret sauce to his ministry. But our Western culture, Jesus really valued prayer. Our Western culture does not value prayer. Don't, we don't value cor corporate prayer. And we, especially even in, our, in the church and in Christian circles, we don't really value prayer. Now, there are pockets here and there, but for the most part, we, we've just kind of like over the ages, we've drifted something that used to be kind of central and primary. We've just sort of drifted away. And um, we kind of are like, wait, you want me to come take time out of my day and come sit in a room and just sit here and do nothing and just like talk to God and say to him what he wants me to say to him? 
Like that doesn't compute because we want some, we want results. That goes against the grain of the world that we live in. And when I say results, don't give me excuses, give me results. If you know, you know. That's another. It's from Madagascar. It's the little penguins. If we have first and second heavens approach, then we will never prioritize corporate prayer. And that's really, at the end of my message, I want you to look at your priorities and go, how am I valuing corporate prayer? And I want to look at my life and say, where am I putting on the priorities list? Where am I putting corporate prayer? And so it's, it's no wonder, because we get stuck in the first and heavens, first and second heavens, that we get... We can't prioritize corporate prayer. And I want to challenge you tonight to waste your time. I want you to waste your time by coming and sitting in this room in a corporate prayer meeting and lifting your gaze. God is seeking worshipers, seeking lovers who will come to this house and waste their life, waste their time ministering to him. Priests who minister to him. You are priests who minister to him. But I said this a minute ago, we live in a culture that's a results-based culture. So it is ingrained in us to not value prayer because we're a results-based culture. And that's why we don't prioritize. It's because we can't quantify. Everybody say quantify. We can't quantify prayer. We can't measure it. We come in to this room and we're just like, uh, this was like a waste of time. It was waste. Like I'm a pretty talented person and I should be doing talented stuff and doing something with my life. And this is not it. And here's, think about this. If we go out and we're like, today we went out and we shared the gospel and 25 people gave their heart to Jesus and we baptized them. Cha-ching, put it on the board. We can quantify that. And we're like, hey, actually today we... We fed a hundred poor people that needed food. They were hungry and we fed it. Oh, cha-ching, put that. Uh, We gave out 50 homeless kits to the homeless and the needy. Cha-ching, we can put that on the board. But it's like we spent however many hours sitting in a room doing nothing. It's like, that nobody's, nobody's excited about that. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to come and sit in the room week after week. And you're just like, uh, especially when you're stuck in the first and second heavens. Because it's harder to measure success. But if we shift from praying with our souls and we shift to lifting our gaze, putting the Holy Spirit in the, seat, in the driver's seat, then we come into this room and we see that the door is there and it's open and we walk through it. And then you're like, oh, this changes things because there's a room full of people who get this. And over here, there's like, man, this person, they're they're gazing on the beauty of Jesus. And all of a sudden, they start getting this download, this this spirit of intercession resting on them. And they're like, I'm praying for the medical workers in central Arkansas. I'm just in my spirit right now. And they start interceding for the doctors and the nurses and and the PAs and all the different hospitals and clinics. And there's intercession going on over here. And then over here, somebody gets a burden for the schools in central Arkansas, the private and the public schools and the principals and the teachers and faculty and the students. And they start praying for revival. And back here, somebody's weeping. And you're like, I don't know why they keep weeping. It's because they just just started whispering Gen Z for Jesus, Gen Z for Jesus. And they're like, whoo, all of a sudden tears are coming. They've got this spirit of intercession on them. There's something really powerful. If we could get a hold of this as a, as a community, as a church, if we could get a hold of this lifting our gaze, coming in into corporate prayer, it would be like a nuclear bomb that went off in this room and it would spill into the city. I'm telling you, it would change this city if we really could tap into this. Amen, Shane. Wow. Uh, Yesterday, my dad uh, sent this. So this came. This kind of came out at the last minute. um, This quote, I loved it. He's been praying for me, um, and so he saw this and shared it with me. This is an Andrew Murray quote. He says, the man or woman who mobilizes the Christian church to pray will make the greatest contribution to world evangelization in history. 
Look at that for a second. I think that when we read that, we go, eh, that's kind of a stretch. I think if we're honest, we're like, yeah, that, that kind of reads good, but I don't really know if I believe that. All right, let's move to Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns and even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home. Go to verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. And then verse 10. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Tonight, we didn't actually sing the verse from it, but we sang that song uh, so much better than the rest, which is, I love it the way Holy Spirit does that because I've been chewing on this for three weeks or longer and Brooke and the team had no idea what I was preaching. And then tonight I'm in pre-service prayer and I hear them in here singing this, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in your house. I'm like, oh, that's right out of my notes. There were several things that even in their pre-service huddle, the worship team, they were, Brooke was saying and praying right out of my notes. The psalmist says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. The doorkeeper is somebody that keeps the door. And the question is, you want me to say that again? Yeah. <laughs> say it louder so the people on the back can hear it. So the th- question is, would you, would you really rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God? Like, just oh, we just need you to hold the door. That's all. And the psalmist is like, man, I would rather, better is one day in the house than a thousand. I could travel all over the world, but I would rather just spend one day in his presence. And I would be super cool just holding the door. And I, I think that we wouldn't really rather be a doorkeeper because, again, we kind of think of ourselves like, hey, I want to be like, you know, I, I don't want that job. I want something a little bit more important. Like, could you appoint me as something that's a little bit more official? Could I be like the chief intercessor or a worship leader? Or I'd like to be something other than just the doorkeeper. Like, is it, you know, it's like, can I, I can't be an influencer and hold the door. Like, I need, like, I can't, I need some screen time. Yeah, seriously, it's like fasting. Nobody signs up to be like, I would love to be the number one faster. Could I lead the fasting ministry? Nobody signs up for that. It's like going to the dentist. Sorry, sorry, dentist. We love you. Pray a ton of dentists to come to this church and I will repent to them. But it's like that. I personally don't like to go to the dentist. All right, better is one day in your courts, God. So our prayer would be, God, make us a doorkeeper in your house. Someone who longs to sit in the prayer room, crying out with boldness, open up the doors, Psalm 24. Let the king of glory in. Open up that door. Let the king of glory in. We need intercessors, people who will come in and lift their gaze. And this room, again, I said this earlier, this room, you're like, this is just a room. Like I've been in many churches and this feels like a lot of them. This room is sacred. Take note of Luke 11, verse 1. I love this little phrase that they slip in there. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. He was praying in a certain place, it says. And there's something special about a certain place of prayer. On God's heart, now sometimes we might be like, yeah, it's just a room. But the God's like, oh, this, uh, this room This is actually the place that I have ordained for encounter to come and be with me, a place, a resting place for my glory. And this is a place where there's that door where they enter in. This is where they come in. And this 
this is a this is a thin space in this concept of thin space, old Celtic uh, tradition, where they uh, they would describe it like this: a place where the space between heaven and earth is wildly thin. I heard that somebody describe it like that. I usually I love they use the word wildly. It's like the, the space between heaven and earth is wildly thin, and it's why a lot of times I know a lot of you probably felt this. You walk in and you're like. In fact, it could be that's why sometimes you come in and you feel the second heavens rumbling and you're like, ah, and it kind of wants to suck you in. It's like, because this is a thin place and the enemy is like, nah, I want to distract you. Don't look at that door. Don't look at that guy over there. I don't, I, Satan, I guess, has a country accent. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know he did till just then. <laughs> don't look at that door. Can I pet that dog? <laughs> Oh, all right. Let me say this again. We have to corporately, we have to, to prioritize corporate prayer in this house and we have to learn to lift our gaze. We've got to learn to lift our gaze. I'm telling you, we've got to get this shift. All right. We're going to go to a passage, Luke 10. It's actually 10 is right before Luke 11 and we're going to go there. And this is, if you've been here for a moment, then you've heard us preach like a thousand sermons. This is about Mary of Bethany. But I just want us to look again at Martha and Mary. So Jesus, it says, entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her, I command you, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered to Martha and says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and you're troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. Hmm. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Martha was distracted with much serving. And Jesus said to Martha, you're worried and you're troubled about many things. You're stuck in this like first and second heaven thing. And one thing is needed. That's what Jesus said to her. He said, one thing is needed. And you know what I think that we say? Jesus is a liar. Mm -mm. I can feel that you're like blasphemy. How would he say that? I, we would never say that because we're good Christian, good Christian ladies and men in here. We would, never, we would never say that. We wouldn't with our mouth, but we say it with our lives. We say it with our actions. He says, I want you to come into this place and prioritize sitting at my feet. And we say, yeah. I mean, Jesus, I know that you said that, but you, you said it like 2,000 years ago. And like then it was probably just sandals and dust. And you got, y'all didn't do a lot back then. <laughs> so I get it. Sitting at your feet would be, it would make sense because y'all weren't even doing a whole lot. But this is 2024 and I think you're out of touch with 2024. We're really busy doing stuff, especially ministry, man. We're doing, like we got to do the stuff to do the stuff. And so what we do with our actions is we say, I don't value corporate prayer. You said one thing is needed sitting at your feet. I don't really value that. I don't think that Jesus is really telling the truth. Does that make sense? How we're saying with our lives, Jesus is a liar. But we good Christian people would not say that. But if we look at our life, are we saying that? Is this agitating your flesh? Kinda. It was agitating my flesh. When I was chewing on this, I'm like, I can't say this. Like Jim Gaffigan, you know, he's like, did he just say Jesus was a liar? Why is he saying that? And listen, it's okay. It, uh, we're all in different places and different seasons. It's okay to be in a season. I just want to give you some grace here. It's okay to be in a season where you're like, uh, I work at, from noon to two on Tuesdays, and I work from seven, uh, from seven to six. I'm just going to stay there. From, I, work from seven, I work from six to seven on Wednesdays. I get it. Like We have seasons in our life where you're like, hey, the times that you all have picked for prayer, they ain't working with my schedule. And that's cool. 
I just want us to have an ache in our heart that if our schedules don't allow us to do that, that as a culture, we're like, oh, I long to be in the presence of the Lord with my brothers and sisters. I long to be going through that door right now. Man, I wish I could be there. I'm going to see if I can watch this live online or I'm going to go back later and watch this and I'm going to contend with them. I want that to be something in our lives where we're prioritizing prayer. And I think the Lord wants to agitate us. I think he's, I feel like he's wanting to kind of put his finger on some things and stir us and provoke us to shift our priorities, to prioritize the one thing that is needed. This phrase, spirit of disruption, would you come and shift us, Mm, is right. This is what God has called us to. I'm getting close to wrapping up here. This is what God has called us to is prayer. It's the the primary thing that he's called us to get right first. And sadly, like I said, it's kind of counterculture. It's not like the norm. A praying church, it's it's not been kind of the, the thing. We look at the Western culture and it's kind of like, ah, we kind of put that in the back. And you might say, you might have some good arguments of why you're like, I don't prioritize prayer because. You might say, well, I don't like how you guys do corporate prayer. And I would say, come into this room and lift your gaze. I would say, come into this room and lift your gaze. I mean, we can be the worst, have the worst format, and you can be over there like, woo, I'm see before me the throne. Like, you can have a revival going on right here, right? It's like, I, I, don't, I don't need to have the, the best uh, uh, format for corporate prayer. You might come into the room and say, man, again, the worship leader is annoying, like, uh, I just, it's hard for me to sit in there because, and I would say, lift your gaze. You might say, it's always so freaking cold in there. And I would say, put on some layers and bring a blanket and lift your gaze. All right, I'm a medal. I'm a medal here. You might say, well, I'm waiting for y'all to launch an evangelism ministry or a homeless ministry or fill in the blank ministry, and then I'll get really plugged in. And I would say, when he doesn't want me to say this, I would say, don't hold your breath. And what? And lift your gaze. Yes. Yes. And lift your gaze. <laughs> breathe. Breathe and lift your gaze. Yeah. So here's the deal. The, the prayer room in corporate prayer, it's, it's so precious and important to the Lord. He's called us to this. We have this mantle that he's called us to. And it is the, the door or the gate. It's the door or the gate to everything else that will be birthed here. So here's what happens. If you're like, hey, I, this ain't my jam, what happens is, is when your jam rolls around and we're like we're launching that ministry that you've been so excited about, there won't be really a place for you. You'll be, you won't be grafted into this structure because he's called us first to be a praying culture, a praying church. And, and, and yeah, and people that have learned to lift their gaze and they've been on the, in the seat week after week contending and like, yes, Lord, send your glory. And they've been going up to the throne room and they're then the ones that will be launched into those ministries. And if you're like, I never really got connected with the prayer room, you, you won't really be grafted in, okay? Does that make sense? Because prayer is central. It's the one thing he's like, hey, I want you to do this well, and I want you to get, get it down. We have to prioritize prayer, properly position our gaze, lift our gaze. Jesus in Matthew 21, we know this, when he comes into the temple and he cleanses the temple, Matthew 21, 12, and 13, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there, And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he says, it is written, my house will be, not might be, not I hope it happens. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making a den of robbers. Okay. And so we know the context of that. We know the context of what he was cleansing. But I think the thing is, is that he is very committed to encounter, to making us a praying people and making this a house of prayer. He's so committed to it that he will keep when we get distracted and doing other things and setting up our tables, 
our money changers or whatever, so it's not an equal parallel, right? But when we kind of get distracted doing something else, he's really committed to walking in and being like, hey, let me help you there, and like flipping our tables. He's okay with that. He actually loves doing that because he's like, I want to center your back. I want to center you back on the one thing that's needed. This is very important. All right, King David. I love this story. Uh, I was reminded of this, this story this week. And I put this in here at the last minute. When King David became king, he, um, the first thing that he did was he went and got the presence of God. He went and got the glory, the Ark of the Covenant. And so the backstory on that is the king before him, King Saul, had taken that, the Ark of the Covenant, which was where the presence of God dwelt, and took it into battle with the Philistines, and it was taken by the Philistines. They lost the battle, and they took, they're like, we'll take your little gold box, and they took the presence of God. But then, it's a long story, all kinds of bad stuff started happening for the Philistines, and it didn't go well for them, and they were like, uh, let's get rid of this thing. So they put it on a cart, and they shipped it back across the border. And it stayed right near the border in storage, basically, for like decades. And then Saul eventually dies, and David eventually becomes king. And the first thing he says is, let's go get the presence of God. And so they go down, and they get the presence of God, and they leave it on the cart. And they're like, hey, you're cruising along. And it's like they're using you know, the world's methods to transport the glory. And it's like, this is working out great. And they were making good progress until they weren't. Because they hit a bump and somebody innocently said, let me just stabilize the presence of the Lord. And they dropped dead. And David went, the fear of the Lord came. And he was like, "Mm, we need to shut this down. And I got to figure out what's what's going on. So Obed-Edom is where they parked it. And David went back to Jerusalem to inquire of the Lord. And for months he did. And then when he came back to get the ark, he came back with the prescription. The Lord saying, this is how you do it. You are to put the ark on the shoulders of the priest. Didn't I say that you're a priest? Did I say you're a priest already? You're a priest. To put the the presence of the Lord on the shoulders of the priest. Okay, this is Old Testament time, but now it's like this window. It's like, oh, we're the priest. Put the presence of the Lord on the priest. And then this is really interesting. And then he said, in every six steps, every six steps, now I'm going to take giant steps. They don't walk like this. I don't think they walked back back in the day like this, but it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, stop it all. Let's make a blood sacrifice. It's like, what? Kill an animal? And okay, so they make a sacrifice and they're like, okay, let's do that again. One, two, every six steps, they were to make a sacrifice. Now that is just hard to get our brain around. And I can tell you, on the cart, they were making some great progress. When they got the prescription from the Lord, it slowed everything down. Making this a prayer culture, making this church a praying church, it will slow us down. You just need to know that. When you start getting like, why is it taking, what's the... It will slow us down. I want to just give you some context real quick. Uh, Obed-Edom to Jerusalem was, it's roughly, this is me doing my conversions because I'm great at that. It's roughly seven to 10 miles. Now, I know that's a pretty wide range, but it's roughly seven to 10 miles, okay? And that's not super far. If you, that would be 30,000 steps roughly, walking 30,000 steps. If every six steps you stop and you make a blood sacrifice, which takes a hot minute to do, that is 5,000 stops that they made. They took seven to 10 miles and they stretched it out. And it had to have been like, come on, right? If we make prayer the one thing and we make it central, it will slow us down and we've got to be okay with that. Now, here's the thing. We don't have to be like, oh God, it's so slow. Will it ever end? Like, we don't need to be that. Well, let's look at David. This is the passage that we all love. I mean, I'm not looking at the real scripture, but it's in there. We'll, we'll get, I can tell you some other time. But here's what happens. When he finally gets to Jerusalem after like the 
499.9 stop. He's finally in Jerusalem. He's in looking distance from his wife to look out the window. This is when she sees a guy out there going, whoa, and he's worshiping half naked. And he's like, the glory is coming. Yeah, he didn't go like, oh, this is taking forever. By the time he gets to Jerusalem, he's drunk with worship. That's what I want us to be. I want us to be lifting our gaze. All right. I'm going to skip reading this. Joel 2, I love. It's like Joel 2 says, gather the people, consecrate them, call them in. And I'm calling you off of your islands into corporate, into something bigger. But Joel 2 says, hey, gather them in, bring them in. And then in verse 28, it's the famous verse, I will pour out my spirit. All, all sons and daughters will prophesy. We all know this, right? This is the the passage that Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when people were like, oh, those guys look drunk, and what's the t- flames on their head, and why are they speaking in these weird languages? He's like, oh, this is what Joel, remember what Joel prophesied? In t- this is that. Well, do you know what that was? That was a corporate prayer meeting. The upper room was a corporate prayer meeting. And then when you look through Acts, you keep seeing this rhythm of corporate prayer meeting and then power of the Holy Spirit, corporate prayer meeting, power of the Holy Spirit. Everything, when we, we, we kind of just read the stuff, it's like, oh, look what the Lord did. It was so cool. Look back and see, oh, they gathered for prayer. There's this consistent rhythm of prayer that I'm calling to you to. And we're not just trying to get more people to show up for prayer, to check off some metrics, to look better on social media. That's not what we're after. Our agenda here is that we want a culture of prayer to be birthed. We want a company of people who know how to gather, come into a room, and pull heaven down, who realize the grace and the gift of corporate prayer, and who for decades will come and contend in Arkansas as it is in heaven. I want to see us get bound together in prayer and pull down heaven, and we gather in this room, his presence is thick, and then we decimate the kingdom of darkness over the city and usher in the light of Jesus and change the city. And Jesus is saying, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. And we're in here going, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. But here's the thing. It's really interesting. Jesus is actually saying to you, you don't have to knock. The door is already open. Come on in. Come up. Lift your gaze. The door is already open. I want you to stand up. I'm going to end this message. I'm going to tell two quick stories. Um, I said earlier that we can't measure. Um, It's hard for us to measure, but we can. There are moments when we can measure a little bit, but we're we're seeing one thing of a thousand things God's doing that we're unaware of. But one really cool thing is both of these kind of have the same same, uh, theme, but I think it's really interesting that um, there's a number of people who really are faithful to come to the prayer room. And one of them is Christina. Christina is a doorkeeper in the house. She comes consistently and sits here. And you, you can see on her face all the time, she's looking at something. And it ain't the first and the second heavens. She's looking at something. And she's gazing on the beauty of Jesus looking in the throne room. And what's really cool about Christina is that she's not even from Arkansas. She was in Colorado. And the Holy Spirit was like, let me take these uh, YouTube algorithms and go, jika, 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 jika. and then she starts watching our stream from Colorado. She has no connection here. And the Lord says into her heart, hey, move up, plant, take everything in your life and move to Arkansas to become a part of this family. That's crazy. That's crazy. It's a planting of the Lord right there and faithful to the prayer room. And another crazy, thank you, by the way, and many others that are faithful in here. There, there's another cool story that the Lord used the uh, YouTube algorithms, and that is our friend who we've never met, who is named Nancy. Yes, I want to make sure I got that. Nancy from Nebraska. So Nancy from Nebraska stumbles onto our YouTube page and starts watching our streams. And she's interacting with us all the time. She's so encouraged and different things that she hears or sees or whatever. And she sends this message recently to Wendy. She says, by the way, will you please let the man playing keys on this Tuesday's second worship set know this? So I'm going to pause. I'm going to tell you 
a little bit before I tell you what this is. The man on keys is Michael Carter, who was on acoustic tonight. Wave your hand, Michael, over there. Michael Carter doesn't even go to this church. He's a worship leader on staff at another church. And he, the Lord's gripped his heart for prayer. And he's like, man, you guys are pioneering something. Can I come and serve? And pretty much every week, he's on keys in here, lifting his gaze and ministering to the Lord. And on this particular day, he's there gazing on the Lord and he's worshiping. And then he, which happens a lot, he gets this prophetic spirit of intercession come on him. And he doesn't go like, oh, now we'll now intercede. It's just like flows out of him. You think it's just another song. And this particular day, he starts singing about prodigals coming home. And he's just in there. He's in the throne room singing about prodigals coming home. Okay, that was a pause. Now we're back to her message. She said, I sent a friend the worship link this morning, cueing her to the song about prodigals coming home. Just now, about six hours later, she let me know her estranged son living three hours away is coming home this weekend to visit. And she says, all glory to God. Simply amazing. What? We're in here praying. We're in here just worshiping. Somebody's probably like, this guy is annoying. It's cold in here. I'm bored. I'm tired. And the Lord's like, oh, somebody's lifting their gaze. That guy right there. Let me have you sing about some prodigals because there's somebody in Nancy's watching in Nebraska and she has a friend who has a son and I need to, I need to break in here. Yeah. Woo. All right. So listen, here's the thing. I want to challenge you. Everybody, you. everybody likes a good challenge. I want to challenge you. This is a bold challenge, and I'm going to say, hopefully, I think the Lord's on this, okay? I want to call you to respond. I want to call you to evaluate your priorities. Look at your life and evaluate your priorities. And I want you to give time in your schedule to come on Tuesdays or Wednesdays or both, if you can, if you really look at your schedule, for the next eight weeks. That's a long time. But the next eight weeks, I would challenge you to come in here, not because there's like, hey, I can promise you there's going to be 30 people. No, there's one person that's here that's important. He's standing at a door. He's got nail scars in his hands, and he's saying, come up here, lift your gaze. But I would challenge you, if you do that, it would change your walk with Jesus, and it would transform this church. If we could get a hold of this and come in and lift our gaze, amen. All right, so here's the response I'm going to ask you now. That was the challenge. I want to give some space for you to pray. Um, and I'm going to dismiss you in just a second, but I want to do a few things. One is I just want this space up here for you to come and pray. If you feel like, man, I, I feel like I'm a doorkeeper and I want more grace. I told you this early. I want more grace. Secondly, you're like, oh man, I really need to evaluate my priorities. This is convicting, this word, but I feel like the Lord's on it and I want to just spend some time before the Lord right here to start off this week of seeking him. Lord, let, help me look at my priorities. That's the second person. I want to invite you to come get prayer. The third person is, you're like, Shane has been so annoying tonight. This sermon is really, really bothering me. You, I would invite you to come and get before the Lord and just tell him how horrible this was. <laughs> just tell the Lord and just see what happens, okay? And then fourthly, we're gonna call the ministry team forward. And I just, if you need prayer just in general, you're like, I just would like to get prayer. It has nothing to do with this. We love praying. And uh, we have a couple of wor uh, words of knowledge that I want, we wanna share with you. Trina, do you have those? I can just say them. You weren't supposed to say that. <laughs> they were so good. Um, uh, one was, uh, one was, I saw someone smoking or vaping. I'm not saying like you're going to hell. That's not the point. You, the thing was is that what we, what I saw was it. It was like you recognized that this was an addiction. It was something that gr was gripping you. Was was had you in bondage. And I saw someone wanting to get free. If that's you, if that resonates. Now, I, I'm going to just kind of, that's what I saw. I also, if you're like, well, that's not me, but I'm addicted to prescription drugs or fill in the blank, alcohol or porn or whatever. 
I also feel like there's a grace. Just come forward and get prayer. If you're like, man, that's, I, I have an addiction. We want to pray for you. God wants to set you free. And the second thing was intestinal or digestive. Um, if there, you have any kind of digestive issues or anything like that, we want to pray for you. So I've gone a little bit long, and I apologize. I want to now just pray over us, and then I'm going to dismiss you. And ministry team, go ahead and come forward. Father, we thank you. Just uh, we pray that your, if this is your word, that you would, um, that it would lodge in our hearts, Lord. That we would become. We know that you're committed to making this a praying church. That you want this house to be called a house of prayer, and the people who gather here, even the people who aren't even, this isn't their church. That they're like, man, I just that there's something here. I just pray more grace on this community here and just the community in central Arkansas at large establish a praying church in Jesus name.